Well, hello everyone and welcome to the um, Oxteg session for this term. Um, I should, for those of you who are new to the group, we have um, sessions throughout the term um, and there's a mailing list which you can join which where announcements are posted and we are currently working on our program for the autumn. Um, what else do I need to say? I think for now, that's it. Let's, let me um, introduce today's speaker. Um, so Cathy Richardson is Professor of the Culture of Robots and AI from De Montfort University in Leicester. She's written on, the anthropo on, anthro the, on anthropology and AI and about um, the, um, one of her books is called Challenging Sociality and Anthropology of Attachment, Autism and Robots. And today she's going to be talking about some of the themes of her book, which will appear next year, called Sex Robots, The End of Love. Um, she's um, been um, active in the campaign against sex robots, now porn robots and campaign she campaigns for women's sex-based rights and for child protection so um with this i will hand over to kathy we'll have questions at the end please so save up any thoughts and questions and those can be done in person raising your hand or um via the chat so i'll switch myself off and hand over to kathy thank you Thank you very much, David, and thank you to uh, Rebecca and David for inviting me today to this group. Um, I really appreciate it, and it's really good to have the conversation. Obviously, it'd be lovely to visit you in person, but this is how it worked out on this occasion. Um, so some of the ideas I'm going to present to you, uh, that it's part of the story, if you like, of my academic research, and it's part of what happened along the way during that uh, process and how I began to think through what these entities were and what they were predicted to, the roles they were predicted to play in our lives and the questions we were asking about them as academics really. And um, so yeah, so without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. So as, as mentioned, hopefully it's next year. I mean, I'm literally just on the rewrites, but you know, time always takes more time. I should say, um, I, um, I am going to present some images um, and they are pretty pornographic. They're not porn, they're not, they're of sex robots. So they're kind of representations of pornographic images on dolls and robots. Uh, but if you're offended by any of that content, I also going to talk about child abuse and some animal abuse. Um, so if you feel that you'll be offended by it, you might, you might not want to stick around. You might want to leave. Um, Obviously, I need to be able to talk about these subjects in order to critique them. So you've got that double, you know, you've got that problem. In order to talk about something you want to critique, you have to talk about the thing that you want to talk about, uh, which is why I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for academic freedom. And, um, and hopefully I will demonstrate why it's important to be committed to that through this research as well. So I'll start with the humanoid robotics group. As the story goes, uh, I was at Cambridge and all my uh, peers, they were going off to Mongolia and Amazonia and various places to do their ethnographic field work. And I went to a robotics group at MIT and they called themselves a humanoid robotics group. This group no longer exists. And as you can see, they've got this beautiful image that's still on the net, it's archived. Um, and so they began to make these uh, robotic entities. When I got there, I thought to myself, you know, being a bit of a lefty in my youth, I thought, oh, they're going to be making robots to do our ironing and our housework. And I, and I got there and they were actually making different kinds of entities. Uh, they were making claims that the, the objects that they were creating weren't about doing tasks or tools or um, extensions of tools but actually they could be used as extensions of social relations. So uh, these were gonna become companion robots and um, they were gonna 
they were going to be inserted into all these gaps in social relations where people lacked intimacy and friendship and comfort from other human beings. Uh, so, for example, one target group were aging populations because statistical da data often reports that they're, they're quite marginalized and report loneliness and isolation. So um, they, they created this new narrative about them as being social entities and they could take on roles that people perform for each other in, in intimacy and friendship. And as you can see by this image on probably your right, uh, she doesn't look very happy about this because most of the drive for this actually didn't come from these groups themselves. It came from uh, inside universities and inside businesses who were basically uh, creating narratives about how their products could be developed and what use they could be put to in society. And so, you know, that's often what's going on in Europe and North America is often contrasted with what's going on in, in Japan. And, you know, the, the other kinds of narratives emerge about Japanese people as feeling more closer to machines than to other people, uh, feeling more comfort with them. So um, my work doesn't really explore uh, I, uh, the, the Japanese dimensions. But there are concerns there as well about some of these narratives. They don't seem to come from uh, the people themselves. They to send, tend to come from laboratories and businesses uh, rather than grassroots organizations. So the demand doesn't come from the people. It kind of is a top-down solution to what is perceived as a, as a social crisis of uh, attachment and, and loneliness. And so from there, I started becoming even more interested in this idea, well, what does it mean to be social? And as anthropologists, we are very interested in that. I mean, it's like one of our core anthropological issues that we explore, you know, what can or cannot be social? Uh, can objects be social? Um, often, you know, we talk about objects themselves having uh, characteristics like gifts that can play kind of symbolic roles in people's lives and, and create social relations. Uh, so I, I was very interested, well, here we have an object that itself is decorated. So in my book, I kind of created an umbrella term to refer to these objects. I call them representational technologies of the human. And I've kind of been inspired by mimesis of Walter Benjamin, Michael Tausegg, um, and others that really think about mimetic, um, you know, representation and mimesis as a way of understanding what objects are and what kind of roles they play. So these representational technologies of the human, you know, we're decorating these objects, we're making them look kind of like us. But what's interesting is like, rather than put them, uh, if we're thinking about ontologies here, rather than put these kinds of objects in the ontological category that says object decorated like human, uh, like a pot or, um, you know, like a, a puppet, these objects seem to be in another category as if something's happened to them, as if actually they're not just, um, they're not just being decorated with what we kind of human characteristics, but that something's being transferred to them, some, some uh, capability, either they're thinking, uh, their feeling or their, well, they're not claiming their feeling yet, but just give it time. Um, but they certainly make all kinds of claims that machines can think. Um, and, and the other side of this is, well, what do people do when they encounter these objects? Because what the technologists do is that they, they record and they, uh, they collect, if you like, examples of what people say when they're in the presence of these objects. So, uh, they, they, they like to collect this data. So if someone's in the presence of these and they go, gosh, it looks just like, you know, um, it, it looks really lifelike that, you know, they're busy. Oh, we better write that down. That's, you know, that's good evidence for us. So I guess, I guess you can probably sense a bit of cynicism in my tone there. And I think one of the most valuable things I did during my field work is that I was in a laboratory make for robots and artificial intelligence for a very, very long time. And I think what happens often in these uh, situations is people are parachuted into these, uh, into these uh, scenarios with these objects. 
and they have a, a very kind of immediate visceral experience of what they're perceiving and experiencing and they they leave with that but actually if you're actually in the lab 24 hours a day more or less 365 days a year or you're in close proximity to the kind of where the action is you'll see that actually the narratives about them start to break down quite quickly but we tend to live in a society where the uh, if you like the fiction of these objects uh, is more powerful than uh, the capacities of these objects um I, I might i'll say a little bit about that but uh, you're going to have to get my book to read more about that. And I write about that in, in my first book as well. It becomes very important then the performative aspects of these objects and creating narratives about them is even more important. And making claims about what they can do in the absence of them making them is even more important. Uh, so that work, you know, those two, uh, my early work at MIT and then my later work with autism, uh, I developed in uh, two books that I wrote. And as I was writing this book, I started to get really interested in attachment because I'm interested in what makes us social. Can anything be social? You know, are, can you create the illusion of sociality and therefore make it interchangeable with what people do? Um, and so, and obviously, and as part of my research as well, I was looking at children. I worked with children with autism um, who had extraordinary difficulties um, in terms of social interaction and regu uh, emotional regulation. So I became very interested in childhood attachment, thinking about childhood and what it means and developmental processes as children um, and what happens when there's deprivation in childhood. So this way of thinking uh, started to transform, if you like, how I began to approach the issues that I that I, I now write about. Um, and from this, I'm going to I'm going to develop a bit more about the attachment, how that is incorporated into what I do a bit later on in the talk. But just to say that. At this stage, after studying robots now for about 10 years, I started to become very concerned about the claims made by these roboticists and those in the field that these objects were doing things like relating and socializing and learning and everything. And, and even now my work, I take a step back and I, I want to problematize that. I mean, clearly the objects are doing something, but I want to argue they're not doing any of those things. Um, so then something else happened. So around, around 2014, I started to see the arrival of these new kinds of entities. Now, before they'd been written about in academic texts, but now the, the kind of, if you like, the materialization of them in, in actual physical entities uh, called sex robots. Uh, became more and more apparent uh, during that time. And I, I, I was at um, DMU and what was kind of exciting about arriving in DMU is that I come from a very anthropological background where the issue is all about, you know, cultural relativism and um, whereas ethics is about judgment. So it was quite interesting then to think, well, what would be the judgment about these objects? Um, and to, I am a, I'm, I am a, a feminist now, I would say I'm very informed by abolitionist feminism and radical feminism. But at, the, at this stage, I wasn't, I didn't actually know much about feminism at all. I knew mostly about academic uh, feminism, which is very different from uh, the radical form of it. Um, so I noticed these entities and I started to think, well, what are they? Um, what are they doing? And then there were all the claims that I'd heard been made in the last 10 years, prior to this for that they could help aging populations, that they were going to help people with autism, that were, they were going to end loneliness. They were now being reapplied in this new domain. And as you can see, the representation of them uh, took on a more sexualized form. So that added a new kind of dimension to how I was thinking through these objects. Before, in a way, it was kind of like, oh, you know, um, it's, it's helping, it's better than nothing. In fact, one of the professors in the lab said to me, it's better than nothing for these aging populations, older populations. And I kind of went along with it. I mean, it's very disappointing to look back and think I went along with that. But 
at the time I didn't really have an alternative uh, that I could respond to that uh, point of view. So not only was I now encountering these new objects, but I was noticing uh, um, that, you know, these parallels with prostituted women, I don't call it sex work, that's quite deliberate. I don't think it's work. I think prostitution is, um, well, you know, I have to read chapter two of my book if you want to know what the, the links between prostitution, but I became very interested in um, some of the ways in which the people who were the who were developing the conceptual ideas. So these were the, the businesses who were developing those objects, but the conceptual ideas were developed by academics, academic communities such as David Levy. And he, you know, when he was asked, uh, what where did you get the idea of sex with robots? Um, and he said, you know, he got the idea from prostitutes that uh, they don't love you or care for you. They're just interested in the size of your wallet. That actually is what I do agree with him about because most, and it is largely women in prostitution, though I appreciate there are, there are men also, but largely women, the, the vast majority of them are in it because they need economic resources or they're in it for a more, uh, for other reasons. They're not there because they're having a great time. That's absolutely true. Um, but it was this analogy, you see, because I've found these analogies before with autism and robots, like a kind of robot was a kind of, it was like an autistic child almost, because like an old, I'm not saying this, by the way, I don't believe this. This is what other people were saying, and I was responding to what they were saying. So I wanted to respond to this. And I just decided to go a bit beyond how I'd normally respond to something. So I did write a paper, as a good academic should do, um, trying to raise some of my concerns, raise the alarm. I have to say that I wrote this paper the, the, the same year that there was a big campaign to stop autonomous weapons, which a lot of academics signed. But interestingly, when I launched the campaign against sex robots, now the campaign about porn robots, I was very, 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 very shocked by the reaction. One, I was shocked by those who were uh, very concerned about them as autonomous weapons, uh, very supportive of them as being developed in these domains, um, and very supportive of them being developed as, uh, you know, kind of sex work robots, as they called them, or other kinds of robots, or, or child sex robots. I actually refer to these objects as child sex robots. Even, even just recently, you wouldn't believe that, um, I've just been asked to review a paper and it uses the term minor attracted person. Um, so I was finding academic in the field using phrases and terms that actually, if they knew more about the, the origin um, of these terms, they come from pro-pedophile communities and other pro-prostitution groups. So that kind of, that, it surprised me actually the reaction, I have to say, because I, I thought I thought people would be concerned about this idea that you could have relationships with objects and that would be enough to, to kind of raise the alarm to get people thinking more critically. But no, the other the other the opposite happened. And actually I was I was attacked. So there's lots of literature about why I'm wrong, um, which of course you should read. We shouldn't censor other people's other academics uh, perspectives. Um, and so I've changed the name. I will explain why I've changed the name later on. But this experience led me to basically find out what the, the, those who came to my aid, believe it or not, were feminists, radical feminists. And I'd not really had much contact with radical feminism. I didn't know much about it. Um, you know, obviously, we all carry around lots of misconceptions of what radical feminism is, like all oh, penetrative sex is rape, um, misrepresenting uh, Andrew Dworkin's argument. So I read these two texts in conjunction, um, Pornography, uh, Civil Rights, Pornography and Civil Rights, and The Politics by Aristotle. And this is why I think it's really important that we, we uh, promote and support and maintain academic freedom because even though I don't agree and my work has gone on to discredit everything that I can, uh, all the ethical values of Aristotelianism, 
I need to be able to read Aristotelianism in order to understand it. Moreover, actually, um, in the politics itself, Aristotelian ethics is very widespread and informs a lot of European, uh, if you like, frameworks that are currently being developed about how we regulate robots, which I find very concerning. I mean, I'm just one person, so um, I, you know, there's a lot of work to be done um, in addressing some of these issues. In conjunction with reading these two texts simultaneously, I started to read through the experiences of survivors. So I was quite a lefty when I was younger, you know, and I was maybe some of the audience members are familiar with Marx's saying about what does it matter if um, in, in relation to prostitution, what does it matter if your hand is being exploited or your vagina is being exploited? Um, it's all part of the same thing. And that's where some of these some of these ideas about it being sex work uh, it arise out of some of them, but Marx didn't just say that. And actually, Marx said a lot of things, and we know more than we did back then. Um, and there are different contexts for sometimes why I said things. So I stopped looking at what, if you like, lefties said about prostitution, and started reading what women in prostitution, particularly survivors women from working class backgrounds, um, what their experiences were. And, this, and this, uh, this encounter, if you like, with survivor narratives transformed my understanding that I realized now it wasn't just an attachment issue, which is originally how I'd addressed and, and the original reason why I'd launched the campaign, because I thought it was undermining human attachment, but now there was this other issue about sexual objectification and women's subordination and deep, you know, um, the way that women have been presented over time as property that was became very integral to my understanding. And that led me more into radical feminism and reading works in this area. So I want to come back back to Aristotle. So I would recommend people have a read of the politics. It's very interesting. It's not a book that's often cited, you know, people are virtue ethicists, they tend to refer to the Nicomachean ethics, but I actually think this one is more interesting because this, this is like his politics, right? It's called the politics. And one of the thing about my book, in my book, you're going to read my politics, if you like, my response to this kind of politics. Um, but I came very interested in his idea of what a slave was. Tools may be animate as well as inanimate. A slave is a sort of living piece of property. So I want you to think there that there's this like mixed ontology in a slave that some, somehow there are, you know, they combine these property, non-property forms together in one, um, which I became very interesting to me about how we begin to think about slavery as somehow inside human beings are property forms. Then there is the master's fantasy in the book, which is, this fantasy is actually, is actually um, described quite a lot by uh, academics, particularly if they want to promote the idea of robots, this kind of, you know, uh, future where we abolish work and we can all read poetry and have sex with robots. Um, you know, this is this is the fantasy that they all refer to. And it's this kind of idea that you have instruments, we've got the instrument there, but they start playing themselves. And, and wouldn't it be wonderful, you know, in the in the fantasy that he has, if they, they start to come alive and um and instruments play themselves. It's a bit like the sorcerer's apprentice. I think that would be a good image with this one. So I'll put that in for next time. Uh, so the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, Mickey Mouse is uh, casting a spell and all of a sudden the brooms start moving around and the pots and, you know, the pots, the buckets with water and then it all gets a bit out of control. But that's more or less uh, the same thing that's going on here. Often this passage as well is, is seen as a signal about how we can create an egalitarian society. But if you actually read it, it's not about abolishing slavery at all. Um, it's, it's just about this, this uh, kind of citizen class, this master class, who can live their lives independent of relations with other people because they can get all these objects to do their uh, autonomous tasks. 
So it's actually an argument for disconnection uh, with, with, with people um, and a kind of connection with objects, if you like, a master narrative in that sense. And finally, what interested me about this book, I mean, there's more than these three passages in it. These three ideas, there's lots more than that. There's all these descriptions about women being property and, and not being um, uh, you know, fully human. But we've got this one, because my work comes from an attachment area, I was interested in this idea of, of bonds. So if in, in the passage here, he talks about um, the, the servant, the, the slave must respond to the master, but the master does not need to respond to the slave. And as anthropologists, I mean, we're very focused on re reciprocal relations, relations between people. And I guess embedded in our universal human rights value system is this I idea of reciprocal relations that people shouldn't have the power over others. And even in our informal relations, you know, one of the advantages we have in our world, I speak as a woman and having women's rights, um, which are somewhat under attack, uh, is that we have a sense that there are, we can have reciprocal relations. We can be as adults with men on equal terms and there's mutuality and children have protections as well. So there's all these 19th century uh, ideals that we, we have embedded, if you like, in our values and our political systems that are about bonds and reciprocity, but not in, not in Aristotle's uh, framework. So just finally on Aristotle, um, so it's not about uh, virtue is among men, it's not about reciprocal rate relationship with those in less power, which will be women and everybody else. Um, and in fact, he went even further than that. He said, friend, you know, they can never be friends for there is nothing in common to the two parties. The slave is a living tool and the tool a lifeless slave. Qua slave then, one cannot be friends with him. So um, remember, he's not talking about robots. He's talking about human beings that through the political fiction or that this human being is somehow part inanimate tool and of course these kind of ideas about female domination female subordination get reproduced in our culture and uh, so these kind of representations and ideas get reproduced over and over again like an echo chamber um, and um, one of the selling points of some of these objects is that they can be your slave they can be things that you can use now I'm not saying this is a huge confusion. There's a huge conversation going on in the field about objects. Firstly, that I believe that a doll is a slave. Um, I don't think it's a slave. I'm a, I believe it's a mimetic representation. So um, as we'll see later, I think what really happens only takes place between people. Um, so between I and you, love takes place between I and you, thinking takes place between I and you. It's not actually, doesn't exist anywhere else and it can't be transferred. Love can't be transferred into an object. Thinking cannot be transferred into an object. But what you can do is you can create approximations. You can create approximated versions of these things as representations. And I think that's what we do. Sex robot. So one of the things I had to oh. do in the book was I had to do a critical analysis. Hang on, sex something's um, something's gone a bit. Oh, I think that was my uh, slide. There had a bit of sound in it, but uh, that's what I had to do. I had to do a critical analysis of a sex robot. So, firstly, I had to think: well, what was it? Was there sex taking place between the owners of these objects and the objects themselves? Now, if we if we regard sex as something between I and you, um, which as a fundamental, it must be between the I and the you, then there's no sex taking place. If we regard it as something that can only involve sex bodies, then there's no sex bodies, so there's no sex taking place. And moreover, we have, you know, we've, uh, um, we've kind of tried to create structures that um, if you like reinforce that idea that it, there's some, there has to be something mutual about the experience. Now, I know in many of our narratives about sex, the mutuality part doesn't count. 
So we're told, you know, uh, men can have sex with children, men can have sex with prostitutes, um, it's sex work, uh, you can have sex with animals. I don't think any, I want to reserve sex using a kind of radical feminist attachment framework for something that is mutual between people, not that something that is bought, not that something that is stolen, not that something that is, is a form of abusive power. Um, now, that's quite controversial because it might seem unfamiliar with, to you, that idea, but let's think about it in regard to children. So we don't talk about, in fact, we used to, and it still goes on, they talk about sex with children. The paedophile had sex with the child. Uh, but a lot of the child rights campaigners has been working very hard to change the language around that. So we don't talk about the sex. We, we kind of describe the power relationship. We say the adult sexually abused the child. And therefore what we're doing is we're putting a different emphasis on the activity. We're not saying this activity is the same as what two consenting adults do, whether they're uh, two men or two women or male and female. Uh, this is a different kind of experience for the, um, uh, the parties. And certainly for one of the parties, it's a very harmful experience. So I decided uh, on the basis of that, I was gonna stop calling them sex robots. And I'm still having some conversations with my publisher about it. Um, because obviously out there in the world, you know, you inherit terms that are out there in the field. So everybody is using these terms. But I think I, in the book, I make an argument for why we should call them pornography. Firstly, um, the way that they're represented. So these are dolls, um, they're not robots. What happens in the field actually is dolls are sometimes passed off as robots or, um, um, or the robots themselves have very minimal kind of technical capacities. You know, if you're lucky, they might have an app you can use with them. And so the mouth might move because of strategically placed motors. Uh, it's not talking, obviously it's like an elaborate puppet, but we call it a robot. So it's more than an elaborate puppet. But anyway, if you look at these images, these are images of dolls. What's really happened is the makers of them, the businesses have watched an awful lot of pornography and they put the image of pornography onto the doll. And so the buyers are buying a pornographic representation um, of, of a woman in the doll. And the same with the childlike one. Obviously, I don't want to, um, uh, some of it is quite shocking, especially, uh, yeah, it is quite shocking, but they, these are dolls that you can, you can, um, you know, buy. You can have them handmade to your specifications, whatever you like. Some of that is illegal, but not everywhere. It's not illegal everywhere. And also there is an argument about, oh, the child ones, yes, I agree with you, they should be illegal, but the adult, you know, the ones that look like grown women, they're fine, they're okay, because women are pornography anyway. So who, so then I, um, oh, I know what I've done. I've, I've put in a slide then I've, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I've changed the name to porn, uh, robots and child abuse uh, porn dolls and porn bots for the ones that look like children. Um, I, I want to put this, oh, I'm afraid I have done an error with that image there. So I tell you what, I'm going to come back to this image because I just need to clean it of this. Um, I was rehearsing, you see. I just need to clean it of its the sound. And I'll come back to it because it's really important. And in the image, what it is, it's basically um, it's 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 images of pornography that are on pots. And um, when we talk about these, when we have these conversations about these objects as well, what we normally find is that the objects, they they we talk about this split off world. So we say, right, these are objects. So therefore the child issue is really good for explaining this. The child, there's not a real child. It's just a representation of the child. Therefore, if you give someone who wants to abuse children this, no child is being harmed. So that's one of the arguments. Therefore, 
and you won't believe this, but there are calls now to like start introducing these as kind of therapeutic, uh, 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 therapeutic trials for paedophiles who are now reframed as virtuous paedophiles um, or minor attracted people. And then you've got the situation where this split off world then, so we, we, um, we live in two worlds, one with the real world, which we kind of inhabit, and then there's a split off world. Now, I'm gonna come back to how we might explain the split off world versus the world that's not split off through these models that I've developed. So in my book, I've developed a pronominal politics, pronominal paradigms, and the first paradigm that I use to explain some of this phenomena, I call the egocentric I model. And many of you will be familiar with this model. It's kind of the I of the Western patriarchal figure, uh, the citizen. It's embedded in our technologies and our ways of understanding technology, um, like Facebook, for example. So it's, uh, it's kind of like you're an individual and you're connected to other individuals. And you can see they're kind of all male and you know representations of the male figure in that in that kind of um, uh, representation, or or we kind of machines and uh, what we we have mechanical parts we can kind of improve and keep developing. And quite interestingly, we've just been doing some work on Mark Zuckerberg, the metaverse, and they actually use this egocentric um, term as well and. It's, he calls it the first person perspective. So now this egocentric, it's called egocentric perception in his model. So it's kind of like, that's the conceptual idea that we're just all individuals. And that's the very classical Aristotelian uh, citizen idea. And then we have what I think is the most dominant model in academia, particularly in anthropology. I call it the undifferentiated we model everything is connected. So I use these representations of it because, you know, I like the Haraway image because it kind of explains it all really. This is a representation of the ideas in her book. Uh, so she's a woman, she's at a computer. Uh, so the boundary between the animal, her and the computer, and then the swirling galaxies in the background. And it's really about the collapse, isn't it, of ontology, the collapse of, uh, of the undifferentiation between different kinds of things. And we have it kind of expressed in other discrete ways through actor network theory, but there are plenty of other models that kind of uh, characterize this. And then we have a model that I'm developing. Um, it's not my idea, actually. What I'm doing is combining lots of different ideas together, um, combining dialogical phenomenology, attachment theory, species specific sociality, all these kind of things. And in this, I'm trying to create a politics of love, what this, what this politics of love might be. So what might it be? It starts from the assumption that when we are born, we do not come into the world uh, ready to interact with anybody. We can't feed ourselves. Uh, we can't re regulate our bodily functions. We need an extended period of caregiving in order to learn how to speak, to walk, to master our own bodies, to regulate ourselves, even to think, to believe that you could think independently of a relationship with another, uh, you know, is a fiction. Uh, so we ourselves, all of us, we are basically, we are not undifferentiated in our attachments, nor are we alone. We have a discrete set of attachments that are very important to us and without them we wouldn't survive and you know there's lots of research about the quality and the kind of attachments that people experience so I became very interested in attachment studies like what goes wrong because some ways in which you can figure out what works is by looking at what goes wrong so clearly there's been lots of studies uh, in Romania when they uh, there were mass um, orphans, uh, there, there were studies about their attachment process, some of the issues that they developed. And uh, there's, there's, I mean, these are terrible stories about human beings, but what, what the evidence seems to show is that many, when they followed up with these um, 
Jim, you know, these children, as they grew older, they had all kinds of attachment difficulties, problems with regulating emotions, anxiety. In fact, sometimes attachment and autism, the, the kind of characteristics of both are so very similar that one, um, uh, in one study, they kind of classified many of these as being on the autism spectrum. Uh, so some of these children that survived Romanian orphanages. So that's very interesting. Now there is another school of thought that says autism is absolutely outside of attachment altogether. And um, anyone who brings anything, anyone who draws on anything related to attachment is normally um, disliked quite intensely. So the Baron Cohen school of systematizing, empathizing, it's biological, it's testosterone driven, is the dominant paradigm, I would say, of autism. But it's not the only paradigm, and they others do exist. There again, why we need academic freedom so that you can go and find and read them. The other interesting area I began to look at was around um, this, I guess, this fiction that we, we could be raised by animals. Now, I, I don't, I see animals as living beings like us. They're not like machines. So they are living. They do have a very species specific sociality that is unique to the species in which they belong. And the, the best, a species can best meet the needs of its own species. So birds of birds, wolves of wolves and, now, um, I was quite interested in this idea that could you be an infant and be raised by a wild animal, you know, um, these stories of feral children. And actually, all the evidence they've, they've I, I don't think I came across one account of an infant surviving over a long period of time with animals. Uh, they could be survived for a few days. Some, some children, who were abandoned by um, their families when they got to an older age, like five or six, so they have some independence. They lived among dogs, for example. I think there was a case in Russia. Um, but even then, you know, this idea, this fiction that even our closest species, even our kin, um, could could raise us. There are even, you know, uh, lots of uh, question marks there about whether that's even possible. So the fact that these objects that are not even alive um, could, could play these roles in our lives is even more concerning. Another interesting thing about these studies is when they looked at them, they found that what the children did is they started to imitate the animals. So um, when they were found them, they might walk like the animal or bleat um, or emit sounds like the animal. So, we are imitating, if you like, we are imitating each other. We are learning through imitation of those around us. So that's one of the attachment mechanisms that we learn. And also we know by looking at animals, I mean, we, we treat animals like their property um, wrongly in my uh, point, from my point of view. And we put them in zoos, um, and they start to display all kinds of disruptive behaviors, self-harming behaviors. They find it difficult to interact because we, what we've done is we've taken them out of their environment and we've put them into artificial ones so that they can be um, basically attractive viewing for us, something to observe. And, uh, you know, they, they experience great distress animals and the animals will show you their great distress by how they're behaving. And this, uh, polar bear. This is in a Chinese supermarket. Someone took a Chinese super, a, a bear out of its environment, put it in a supermarket, and it's clearly uh, displaying great distress. But we have, we sometimes we have little empathy for animals around us. And again, they did it with Harry Harlow's monkeys in the 1950s. So you can really see this uh, distressed infant here. Uh, they created this environment. You've got two. Um, you've got two choices for the monkey. One would have a food bottle attached. The other one would have a soft covering. The monkey would go to the food and eat, and then spend the rest of the time. And what um, what we learned from this apparently is that, well, some of the findings were that actually infants need comfort and care as much as physical 
as much as their physical needs being met, they need these emotional comfort aspects of their being. Some people have argued that the survival of these monkeys show that we can live with artificial entities, um, quite concerningly. Also, I think if you think about the follow up stories of this, so when this monkey comes into being, you know, it learns how to be a monkey through its uh, contact with its mother and its carers, its, those in its environment. It's been deprived of that experience, but when they kind of became rescue monkeys at the end of these experiments, uh, they, they displayed self-harming behaviors and, um, uh, you know, had difficulty interacting with other species. And I think, you know, that's very similar if we think about what's going on, things that we should be doing spontaneously with each other, which is communicating and interacting, we're finding more and more those things are becoming more and more difficult. You know, people are lonelier. Uh, they report to be lonelier. They report to have difficulties with social interaction. And it's kind of like, are we, to, to refer to Max Weber here, creating, you know, an eye and cage for ourselves with all these technologies and cutting ourselves off from our relations with each other? Right, I've only got a couple more slides. Um, my work has also been uh, very influenced by the work of Martin Buber. Now, Martin Buber is very difficult to follow and understand. And I'm, I'm not religious, so I don't take the religious aspects of his work. I don't incorporate them into my, uh, if you like, my, the, the paradigm that I'm developing. But what I think is really important about what he says is about how we aren't ever you know, we might have this idea that the I, we can say I, right, without saying you, but we're always implying a you. And he came up, you know, he framed it as everything is between I and you. So love is between the I and you. So even though um, at all of us, our love is between our I and you, our discrete um, and differentiated set of attachments, and it's that's what we bring into the world, not just me, every single human being. It's what's between us. So if we're creating a fiction that somehow what's between us can be between us and, a, and an image on an object. So if we think about what a robot is, it's an image on an object. That's all it is, an image on a surface. A sex robot is a pornographic image on a surface. And... Um, what we're saying now is images on surfaces uh, that have some computational dimension to them are interchangeable or like or, uh, human beings. And actually that something magical has occurred, like in the Sorcerer's Apprentice, we've transferred something outside of us as being human, which we can only actually have because of our a relationship with each other, right? But somehow magically we've transferred something outside of ourselves into these objects. And these objects then transfer something inside of themselves back into us and vice versa. So I started to then think about how I would organize our ontologies and where I would start to put things. Um, and so I would, I mean, I would like some EU funding to kind of develop this further. You know, these egocentric paradigms over here, what they mean, why are they egocentric? The undifferentiated we ones over here, everything is connected, breakdown of boundaries, uh, very problematic. And then the IU attachment, where we're starting to think about our attachments with each other, that we don't exist inside of property, outside of it, but we live in a society, we've lived in slave systems and capitalist systems that want to continually keep us inside a property dynamic. And I think if we, um, in the work that I try to do, it's try to look critically at all those theories that try to keep us inside that property dynamic. And I think that's why they dominate, actually, because they can echo this perspective. But these, uh, these theories, attachment theory, um, dialogical phenomenology of Martin Buber, radical feminism, ch children's rights, trauma-informed psychotherapy, I would include non-violence in there. These are all about privileging um, attachment between people, recognizing empathy, mutuality is the basis to our existence. 
And that informs uh, the politics of love, which I am trying to develop. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any immediate questions. Um, uh, if there are, while people are getting their thoughts together, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and I'm kind of monitoring that. I don't know if anybody else, David, or anybody else has an immediate question. I, I'm happy to kick off if if there's no other questions. Uh, thank you very much for a really stimulating and interesting talk. Um, I, I have a little bit of an interest in some of these things myself. I'm an anthropologist of Japan and robotics, as you're probably aware, is a very hot topic yeah. in the anthropology of Japan at the moment. Um, and people are doing a lot of research on companion robots. Um, mainly companion robots. Uh, the issue there is that, as far as I can tell, many of the attachments that you've talked about have disappeared before the machines, if you see what I mean. Uh, so they have a, ma a massive demographic pro uh, crisis, uh, a, a very um, elderly population, many people isolated, which didn't used to be the case you know, a few decades ago. Uh, and are increasingly turning to the potentiality of robots to, I think, help uh, fill some of the gaps generally that they are anticipating in Japanese society with a, a continuing plummeting population and expanding elderly population. So I think the main conversation there probably has to do with companion robots. So I guess one question I have is, I mean, I'm thinking about attachment to inanimate things, and I'm not sure if this is what you were saying, but I guess one axis along which you could think about this is the animate and the inanimate, which um, arguably maybe in societies like ours, we recognize that distinction quite strongly, but in other societies, and Japan is one that's often cited, it's a less, uh, it, 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 the, the distinction is not emphasized to the same degree. And uh, anecdotally, people say that the Japanese have a less of a problematic, generally speaking, with robots, perhaps in part because of that reason. So historically, I mean, I think the Western tradition has quite a negative relationship with the idea of robots for all sorts of reasons, replacing humans in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's often argued that there is a less problematic and a more optimistic attitude towards potentiality of robots. So I guess my question is somewhere along, I mean, is there is there room for a, a kind of optimistic view of usages of robots in some situations. I'm also thinking of people like, you know, the idea that much of our social life is performative, gender might be performative, Judith Butler kind of thinking, um, you know, if that's the case, can robots be, I don't know, uh, programmed to, to perform in a sense, in a similar way and to, mimic sociality in a way that's uh, benevolent and not necessarily uh, negative. Uh, and yeah, I, I think that's my sort of questions. Those are my thoughts anyway. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. It's, it's interesting, this idea of what attachment means, because I think um, when attachment theory was being developed by John Bowlby and others, it was looking at uh, how um, particularly children were responding to their mothers mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes their fathers, but they also looked at sibling studies. And interestingly enough, this idea that you can become attached to things was taken up by um, corporations and they started to incorporate attachment theory into thinking about branding and marketing. So you could become attached to products. But what they actually did in that process is completely rewrote what attachment was uh, so that's the first thing i would say and japanese kids 
everything I've said there, it's irrespective. The attachment I'm talking about is the human attachment, the human bonding that is required in order to survive as a human being. That's what I mean exclusively. It doesn't matter if you're from Mongolia or an, and an infant, it's universal. It's Japanese infants attached just like, uh, I mean, there might be variations obviously with weather and temperature, and but um, they still need a human being to care for them in order to learn how to speak and walk and regulate their bodily functions. So I think that's the first thing to say, you've got to figure out, well, what, what are people really meaning by the word attachment? Are they meaning just something that you use um, and you kind of incorporate, if you like, into your fantasy life? Or are they talking about this humanist, this stuff, which is not just about our species, other species have attachment processes as well, because they need to survive with each other. And if they don't have the attachment process, then they, um, they can't regulate their emotions either. And they often can't reproduce because, I mean, one of the biggest problems with putting animals in artificial environments, for example, is they, you have to like intervene in order to get them to reproduce because they're not doing it spontaneously because they're thinking probably uh, the, it's so unnatural unnatural in the sense of it's not spontaneous anymore there's been too many interventions and disruptions in their developmental process i would say and as, as i said the ontologies that mix people and property together are the ones that survive in our culture i can guarantee in japan there are ontologies that are just humanistic but I bet you they're pushed to the margins, right? As far away from the corporate kind of scientific enterprise orthodoxy that exists. They exist in Japan and they exist everywhere. But often you find these more human or these kind of attachment focused ones that don't mix people and property are not the ones that become dominant in any culture. So you talked about Judith Butler there. The reason that mixes ontologies as well, that flattens distinctions and undifferentiated we. That's, uh, that works better for a, a property structured society because then you can market that idea. Ah, if you need goods, if you need, if you need objects in order to perform something, you don't need human relations, you need objects. Right. Or you, you know, and you can create new objects, you can have operations that can mimic uh, aspects of the opposite sex. In fact, let's just do away with sex and let's try to stop any conversation about sex whatsoever. And then that way we, we can just usher in these um, new technologies and these this new politics. So in the same way that that might be dominant in our world, the kind of mixed ontology in Japan is a very dominant ontology but i i would say whose interest does it serve well first of all is it actually true and i would say um it's more complicated than um that and whose interest is it serving if anyone's making money out of it then of course maybe that's where our question should be how much money is being made out of it compared to other types of things also i would say as well Japan is extraordinarily sexist. I mean, it has some huge issues with sex inequality going on in Japan. Um, child representational child um, abuse imagery, for example, is widespread. Um, there are lots of issues to do with inequality that haven't been addressed in Japan. That that are kind of, that are very connected with these ideas of attachment and care for the aging populations and all kinds of other issues. They're not discrete. They're compartmentalized as different phenomena, but they're actually more interrelated than, yeah. than I would say that people claim. Yeah. What do well, you I, think like, of that? I was going to say most of what the, the research I'm familiar with is focusing mainly on companion robots for an aging population and i think the consensus is that as of uh, as of this moment it remains very problematic practically never to say nothing of the wider issues that you're raising that have to do with morality etc cetera, etc cetera. 
But uh, I think the interesting perspective in the Japanese case is the human attachment is already the problem. The lack of human attachment is already the problem. Uh, and I guess the ro you know, from a government policy perspective, the po com companion robotic robotics is potentially part of the solution, of the long-term solution. But the attachment problems that you mentioned I'm thinking again of the older population are already there. I think in the younger population, well, there's also uh, issues that have to do with, um, you know, reproducing the population and why a younger generation is not doing that. But that's another issue. So yeah. thank you very much. But, but yeah, I think they're very connected there. I would also say, you know, in Japan, they did drop two nuclear weapons on the country. Right. So they were the experiments, if you like, of the Second World War. And I think that's not really been understood in its full force. What you do when you annihilate, when you try to annihilate a population um, and, um, you know, communities have been who were destroyed through those kind of practices. So, yeah, lots of interesting things to think about there. I'll have to look at some of your work then to see what you're up to. Absolutely. Thank Any you. other questions? Anybody else? Open the floor to other questions. David. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for this. Uh, was I particular? Oh, uh, actually, sorry. Just coming off your discussion with um, Bill, I've remembered that Yorick Wilkes gave a seminar to Oxteg a few years back about companion robots. Um, but um, I wanted to, I've got a comment rather than a question really. It's, um, I, I really like the um, way you are using the topic to, um raise issues of big theory with a big capital b and a capital t so aristotelian politics i don't know it um but i absolutely i, I, I um in endorse and the, your the way you're going about this and i think this is the sort of sophisticated approach to contemporary um, technological issues that we desperately need. Two examples, just as kind of more ammunition, really. This morning, I was at a seminar of one of our new research students who is going to be working on alternative currencies. In her case, um, in French Basque land and really the whole point of the thing is that sh that her research is seeking to look at the politics of money it not as understood by economists but as understood by nationalists so that by using your own currency you do so much more than just enter into um, financial interactions. And then I've just been looking at um, <coughs> the participant list, but sadly, one of my students who um, is working on brain computer interaction isn't here, but I'll make sure he has a listen to the recording. He's been using the work of um, John Forge on the ethical dilemmas of dual use in technology and combining this with Nigel Rapport's work on cosmopolitanism and the idea of what love can be repurposed to mean as a way of um, reaching some form of ideal politics. Um, so yeah, th that's just a comment, um, some kind of ways of making connections with other works, but yeah, no, thanks so much for the paper. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, 
yeah, bringing together interesting and different ways of understanding these issues is something that I'd very much welcome. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask, are you going to be attending the RAI Future of Technology? No. <laughs> no, I, I suppose so. And then my personal timetable got messed up. So I, and they put me on a day when I couldn't. So I'm about to record a presentation about the idea of futures. But I sadly, I can't be there. Yeah, so that would be a good environment to kind of explore these issues. But if you look at the um, if, if you look at the content of some of those abstracts, buying into this idea that you can have these mixed ontologies is really, I would say, the dominant theme in the abstract. So I'm thinking, where is, um, yeah, unfortunately, but who knows when you get there, maybe you'll find, I'll find other people that are thinking through things differently. Is that it? <laughs> other <laughs> questions? Any Anybody in the chat? Um, other questions from the floor? You can just raise your hand. I think we've got a small enough group that we can probably uh, voice questions if you want to do that. Any... No, it's Monday. It... And, and it's the summer term. Yeah. Oh, we normally have more responses i can't see anything uh here we go i think oh. something okay here we go this is david smith i was just wondering if you have something to say about the makers of porn robots like those in china um well i i think that it's a bit like the apple product i think the designers are in europe and north america and they're just being mass produced in china because it's cheap labor I don't think all the designers are coming from China, but I, I don't think you were meaning that, right? But yeah, I mean, like they must be thinking what's going on like in the West because they've, they, they've got like childlike ones that they're producing there. In fact, I, you know, I, I, I do want to do a research project on what's going on because some of the... I mean, there's the, there's the environmental issue, which is what happens when you create this object that requires a lot of um, silicon and plastic to produce. Um, and then it's uh, top heavy in terms of resources, in terms of its manufacture and maintenance. Oh, we've got a, a question, but yeah, there's lots of... Di yeah, um, I will have a look at it, David, thank you. Yeah. Hannah Kirk has a question. Hi, Kathleen. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. I work in the space of AI and language understanding. I was just wondering what kind of similarities or differences you see from your work on like embodied robots to um, like those types of apps like virtual girlfriends or sexualized chatbots. Uh, what are like the takeaways we can take from your work on robots to uh, less like embodied forms of AI? Yeah, thank you. So I think they're I would put them all under the same umbrella heading in a way. I, um, that's why I think they're called representational technologies because I, I don't actually think anyone's actually produced a robot as it happens. Um, a, robots are a fictional idea and they exist in a text. What people have done is they've created a, a kind of representation of that idea in the objects that they've created, but they haven't created robots. They've created, they've drama, you know, it's a bit like when you've dramatized, you've got the first robot play, and then you've got dramatizations, new plays about robots, and then you've got books, and then they turn into dramatizations. And then you've got people who read that book then who make objects that resemble those ideas in dramatizations. Um, yeah, I think with artificial intelligence as well, I think there's a whole, the whole language around it is very problematic. Uh, there's no artificial intelligence at all. There's no thinking machine. It's not going on. 
I mean, I hope I convince people that you can't actually think outside of relationship. People don't come into the world as a lone singular unit, right? They have to have a relationship in order to survive. And if you can't survive, then you can't think. So every, even our thinking is, is attachment based. It's based on us having attachments with others. Um, it's the IU attachment. So what we're doing is we're saying we can create these entities that can mimic or some of them don't even use this language of mimesis. I mean, they really believe it is thinking, right? You must come across that all the time. People often say in papers like our model better understands the data or better understands the world. And it's that word understands, which is really interesting in that context. Our, our program is learning. Uh, nobody can learn outside relationship. It's doing something, but uh, but it's not learning. It's What it's mimicking is kind of calculation often and probability. So I would, you know, I would call these objects computational engineered objects. And I would put the ontology back into the, back into the property one and out of the human one, you know? So I'm sure you, you are I'm sure when you interact with all these experts, they don't see themselves as puppet makers, right? They don't see their, they don't see themselves inside the category of dolls and puppets and statues. They see themselves as outside of that category into this new one that they've created, which is like this, um, this mixed ontology between humans and machines. But they're not, they're still in that category. All they're doing is they're using this computational engineering to elaborate on the object. In computational devices as well, I think there's probably, I think it's probably gonna be in computation that this fiction is gonna be more prevalent because it's easier to create an animation than it is to create an embodied object. Cause you have to pick up, you know, you have to, when you order, um, a porn robot, you know, it arrives in a coffin and you have to assemble it, right? So you have to get the Allen key out and like do its arms and uh, um, and then you have to pick it up and then you probably have to put clothes on it and put some makeup on. And then it's like, oh, if you live in a two story house, you've got to carry it upstairs and then carry it back down. Do you know what I mean? The fiction, the illusion is going to be uh, and you're probably going to need a lot of alcohol after to keep that illusion going. Whereas on these representational these representational devices, um, you know, what they're mimicking sometimes, so much of our interactions with each other is taking place in ways where we're not actually face to face, we're not seeing each other, we're sending each other messages. So if you can mimic messages, you know, but they can't mimic messages, but I think if you can do that, then you can mimic something that people are already doing. And, um, and then you can sell more products. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you. Sorry, um, Bill has to run for his uh, next his next meeting. Um, so, are there any other comments, questions? Um, I can't see anything in the chat. There's a link to the documentary. Oh, yeah, I'm clicking on the link. Um, Peric Salvini yes. has raised Thank their you. hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for your uh, interesting talk. And um, sorry, I was I was traveling, so I couldn't uh, attend fully. But I was wondering. I heard you talk also about um, robot for developed for autistic children in therapy and in in this field, I was wondering whether in your research you found any benefits deriving from the development of this robot and the, the sort of relation and interaction that can be achieved with autistic children. Right. Uh, I, I, so my therapeutic approach is relational as well. So the, the type of work that inspires my if you like my understanding of therapy, the ones that seem to work are person-centered. So 
Client-Centered Therapy is a very good book. Um, Jacob Moreno's Psychodrama. Anything where, where the focus is on the relationship. Um, I don't, I'm not against the idea, like if you go into a therapeutic environment, a therapist will often use a range of objects to kind of engage um, someone in a therapeutic scenario. So I have no problems with that. I guess my problems are when you start to make extraordinary claims about these elaborated puppets that, well, interestingly, they do use puppets with children with autism and they seem to work just as well as, as if not more, even if not better than robots, but because they're not um, technological, they kind of, that's not as exciting as developing robots for children with autism. Um, and the people developing the robots, they don't think they're developing elaborated puppets. They believe they're developing these other ontological entities that are capable of all these other ontological characteristics. So I would say um, it depends on the claims if the claims of the people that they have a therapeutic paradigm that is relational, that is person-centered, and they enroll an object in order, but the, the relationship between the therapist and the child is what's primary, and they enroll objects, then I don't mind them using robots. If, however, and I know this is going on because I've worked on two projects now with autism and robots, um, if, however, they say that the robot is doing something to the child and there's no need for a therapist, then I have problems with it. And then I think we should be, we shouldn't actually be putting any resources into developing that kind of idea. Thank you. That reminds me of um, someone else who isn't here, um, which was the work of um, our student Neil Armstrong, who looked at app based therapies um, actually in the Oxfordshire area and as it were, why they didn't work. All oh, right, yeah, what did, uh, what did he find? Um, that they didn't work and yes. that, they, that, that they were being touted as a way of saving money. Yeah, they're um, not interested in that, honestly. These um the priorities are, are to not go with people-centered solutions to problems but to go with tech tech focused mm. ones that's where all the money is yeah Even absolutely it's difficult to do research now that doesn't involve technology it's very difficult mm. although the yes i mean and the other thing that you've also just put in my mind um are kind of african masquerades where you know you don a costume sorry spoiler alert um <laughs> you don a costume and you become something else and yeah. i i suppose what that raises to my mind is the problems with using ontology we're in danger of kind of overusing the word and i, I mean as a non um, a non participant in the ontological turn, I just don't find it very helpful. That, um, but I don't know. Um, yeah, you know, does it help to say that we are switching ontologies? Um, well, I, I, yeah, I, I guess it's whether by putting. Um, you know, you can put on a cloak and you can put on a crown and it doesn't make you a queen. You know, like Mark said about the, the throne is not just a chair. Mm. It's, yeah, it has to be a throne in certain kinds of contexts. Um, but we're kind of reversing that and saying, no, if you say it's a crown and you say the chair is a throne, then you're a, a king or a queen. Yeah, and then that, that is doing something different. Yeah. Um... Uh, it's Gombre and um, hobby horses. Um, uh, and yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, all these theories of, of mimesis um, that you were alluding to, and, uh, Mictal, particularly Mictalsig. Um, yeah, 
absolutely. Um, and, and this is where the theories have politics. Yeah, that's right. Um, and they're, they're not even around these days. You know, we're not talking mm -hmm. about these things anymore. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think their work is great. Read their work; it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much for a yep. fascinating um, presentation. I'll, I'll send, I'll tell the people I've mentioned <laughs> to listen to the recording. Um, thank you so much for the questions. And um, I will see some of you at any rate um, the other side of the summer. And I think there is the hope that some of our next year presentations will even be in person. Um, so unfortunately, we can't take you out for a drink, which is the what once upon a time was our tradition. Um, it seems like a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, but um, and I hope you um, have interesting sessions at the RAI conference, my God, which is next week. It is. Oh my no, the week after next week. Week after. Week? Oh no, it isn't. It is next week. Oh my goodness. Right. A lot to organize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, David, for the invitation. Have a nice evening. Thanks. Bye, Bye. everyone.